Okay, thank you so much, Derek. Uh, the next uh, speaker is uh, Jonathan Marks. Uh, he's going to talk about a very concrete and very well known, very almost epitome of where institutional corruption can lead to very public and very private hurt. So. Thank you very much, David, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I should disclose that uh, I am not now and have never been a university president, unlike the esteemed, many of the esteemed speakers who precede me. Um, I certainly wouldn't be good for a Stradivarius loan guarantee, um, but I do teach at one of a number of universities where if you wanted such a thing, you'd be best advised not to go to the president, but in fact to the football coach. Um, my one important disclosure is that um, I was counsel, as a barrister in London, I was counsel for Nancy Olivieri um, and the European Court of Justice in uh, regulatory proceedings or legal proceedings to challenge the equivalent of a European, the European equivalent rather, of an FDA new drug approval. Um, not an issue I'm going to be focusing on, but I think it's an important thing to mention. Um, I will also say that uh, my involvement in that case in the European Court of Justice, acting as Nancy Olivieri's counsel, was really for me a seminal event, a part of the transition from a lawyer in full-time practice to a bioethicist, because I was struck that as interesting as the legal questions were, the ethical questions were compelling, and indeed the systemic problems that I felt her case revealed were too challenging to ignore. And so that has fueled my uh, research for the last decade in many ways, including my what is now a three-year relationship as a uh, fellow at the Lab on Institutional Corruption that uh, Larry Lessig runs. All right, so um, I'm not going to go into all the details of this case because um, they take up uh, more than 500 pages together with appendices of this report, the Olivieri report, prepared by um, a team of three on behalf of the Canadian Association of University Teachers. Um, so of necessity, I will have to omit some important details, but I will draw um, heavily on uh, this report and some other materials in the public domain. What I should just tell you to put this case in context um, it involves a condition, thalassemia major, which causes uh, an abnormality in hemoglobin so that hemoglobin cannot properly bind and release oxygen. The red blood cells um, look like this. As you can see, they're pale and crumpled. The condition uh, results in an anemia. Sometimes it, it's called Coolidge's anemia for that reason. And just as sickle cell disease is common amongst um, uh, certain populations, so is uh, this condition. It's common in the Mediterranean, in Greece, Cyprus, and others, um, and also amongst Greek communities in Australia, Sri Lanka, and elsewhere. The consequence of having this condition is that you're required to have regular blood transfusions, um, and the effect of those blood transfusions is that iron levels start to build up in the heart, liver, and other organs and to the point where it becomes uh, fatal, and it's inf very important, therefore, to have a drug to take the iron out of your body. Hence the need for an iron chelator. And um, many people who have this condition die in childhood. Um, now, um, because of these therapies, they make it into adulthood. And the standard chelation therapy to remove the iron that builds up in the blood is an all-night infusion um, to a device attached to your bedside for several nights a week, often five or more nights a week, which can be uncomfortable and um, potentially intrusive, but it's a treatment that works and is effective. So um, Nancy and, and many other experts tell me. I'm sorry. Um, but clearly, the administration of another form of therapy that might be easier for teenagers, teenagers and um, other young patients to take was very appealing. And so in 1989, Nancy Livieri began work on the trials for a new drug called um, deferoprone or L1. The idea is you'd be able to take these pills orally and that would cause you to excrete the, um, the iron that had built up in your body. And as I say, it would be particularly appealing because uh, the infusion might be unpleasant for children. So in order to get the drug approved and part of the process of trying it out, a randomized control trial was necessary. 
And Nancy Olivieri went, went to um, the MRC, the Medical Research Council of Canada, and asked for funding for this trial. And they said, come back when you have an industry sponsor. So that's what she did. She went to get an industry sponsor, and that company was a company that hitherto mainly made generic drugs. And you may have read its name in the newspaper because it tends to end up in battles with big pharma. But this company um, agreed to fund the randomized control trial, and a contract was drafted which contained this confidentiality clause. Um, all information, whether written or not, obtained or generated by the investigators during the period of this agreement and for a period of one year thereafter, shall be and remain secret and confidential and shall not be disclosed in any manner to any third party, except to an appropriate regulatory agency, etc., etc., etc. Including a provision for an, a no submission of information for publication without approval by Apotex, a clause that might now um, cause uh, some university administrators to become greatly concerned. But at the time, this is 1993, there is um, no review process for these contracts. The um, Research Ethics Board, which is the equivalent of what we would call an IRB, um, does not uh, review these materials. And so this is the clause that was in the contract. And indeed, um, when the dispute I'm about to tell you about uh, blew up, uh, it was necessary for the Committee of Inquiry that I've described, the Canadian Association of University Teachers, to commission a legal opinion from the Dean of Queen's University Law School in Canada. And he uh, argued, uh, he expressed the view, um, not surprisingly, that he believed it was a legal duty for a researcher to disclose a material sig or significant risk to patients. And indeed, that um, the clause I've just referred you to was so broad and sweeping, that should say, that it may um, include, it would include patients, but that to the extent that it prohibits a physician from disclosing to a patient a material significant risk, it would be um, void and illegal as a matter of public policy. Um, so, uh, although this wasn't litigated, um, what's clear is, and I think it's important that the this is an added here in the opinion, the researcher doesn't have to establish the complete accuracy of her concern. A risk is a risk, not a certainty, but only that it was not an unreasonable concern. So um, this was not the only um, contract between uh, uh, the researchers and uh, the industry sponsor of the trial. There was another, indeed, where they essentially provided the drug for a long-term efficacy study that Nancy Oliveri had started in uh, uh, several years before, that contract had no confidentiality clause. And the significance of it as follows, is as follows. In 1996, Nancy Olivieri became concerned while conducting the trials for deferoprone, this new drug, that it was of declining efficacy over time. And subsequently, she also became concerned that it um, was toxic, causing, among other things, um, uh, the progression of liver fibrosis. Now, um, these risks she discovered in the course of this other trial for which there was no um, confidentiality clause in the contract. But um, the events that followed were really quite striking in many senses. When Nancy Olivieri told uh, the drug company that she wished to, to reconsent the patients to inform them of the new risk benefit profile, they objected. They objected even though the Research Ethics Board, the equivalent of the IRB, had agreed that these were changes that should be notified to the patients. Um, a, a threatening voicemail was left on um, her answer machine, and it was the beginning of a prolonged campaign of threats to exercise vigorously their rights under the confidentiality provision of the other contract. Um, What's striking is in this example is not so much the behavior of the drug company, although that is striking in itself. What's striking and important for us is the response of the University of Toronto and the Hospital for Sick Children, um, both the institutions with which Nancy Olivieri had an affiliation. And what's striking about it is their failure to intervene to protect her to protect the participants in the trial, 
to protect the integrity of the science, to protect public health. Um, the only thing that happened in the immediate wake of these threats of legal action was that the dean of the medical school asked Apotex if they might kindly stop threatening Nancy Olivieri, um, a request which, of course, was um, not honored. The drug company sacked her from the clinical trials. They took the data that they thought considered to be unfavorable and discounted it by um, fabricating protocol violations. Namely, if a child was due to come for a liver biopsy on a certain day and the, um, they couldn't come because they were sick and the liver biopsy happened a week or two later and the result of the biopsy was unfavorable to them as industry sponsors, they discounted it. And then they submitted the data to the um, European equivalent of the FDA, the, Euro the, the EMEA as it's called, for a marketing authorization. That's the equivalent of a new drug approval. And in the course of doing so, they attempted to discredit um, Nancy Olivieri to the regulators. And I'll leave aside um, that whole process uh, for the moment and come back to the question, where was the university, where was the hospital for sick children, and why didn't they stand behind Nancy Olivieri at this moment of crisis? <laughs> and what's interesting is, uh, as the Canadian Association of University Teacher Reports uh, points out, is the relationship between Toronto's university and the hospital for sick children on the one hand and Apotex on the other. The sums coming to the institutions from the research contracts themselves were small. But what was most significant was that since the early 1990s, the University of Toronto had been engaged in discussions with the drug company for a multi-million dollar donation for a new biomedical research center. Um, the agreement which was reached in principle in spring 1998, as these events of which I'm describing were in full bloom was a, an agreement to donate $20 million to the university, an additional $10 million to the associated teaching hospitals, which um, included um, the Hospital for Sick Kids. With match gifts, this would have amounted to a figure in the region of $92 million, the largest ever to the University of Toronto and affiliated hospitals. In the fall of 1998, when the widespread media coverage of the controversy between um, Nancy Oliveri and the, the other actors was uh, really entered the public domain, the university and uh, the drug company Apotex agreed to suspend discussions about the donation until, quote, the dispute was resolved and, quote, Apotex was cleared of wrongdoing. Now, to give you a sense of how uh, close the relationship was between the university and the drug company and how important this potential donation was. In 1999, I'm sorry, in 1998, the drug company asked the university president, President Pritchard, if he would lobby the, the government of Canada against proposed changes to drug patenting regulations that would have adversely affected the interests of the company. As I told you, the company had historically been manufacturing a lot of generic drugs. The president of the university wrote to the prime minister of Canada at the request of the drug company, stating that the proposed government action could jeopardize the building of the university's proposed new medical sciences center. It was a course of conduct that the president subsequently came to regret and to admit was inappropriate. But the fact that such a request could have been made demonstrates, in my view, the influence of the impending donation. It so happens that the president's of the university's request was unsuccessful, the lobbying effort failed, Apotex withdrew from the agreement um, to donate in the vast sums that we described. We don't know exactly how much was given, but in 2000 it was announced that Apotex had made a smaller multi-million dollar gift somewhere between the five and 10 million category. So during the time these events uh, were brewing, Nancy Lavieri essentially had to rely on um, the Canadian Medical Protective Association for legal advice and legal defense. 
She has, uh, in the course of her, uh, the many years that have followed, invested substantial of her own sums in her legal defense. But as the report points out, the defense of the institutional and societal interests, and I'm quoting, was the, at stake was the responsibility of the university and the hospital. Um, in early 1999, Nancy Levieri was uh, relieved of her position at, hospital, at the Hospital for Sick Kids in Toronto, and it was this that caused the Canadian Association of University Teachers, the University of Toronto Faculty Association, and the University of Toronto Administration to intervene. Um, my colleague uh, at the Safra Centre, Gary Gray, who was a, an undergraduate student at the University of Toronto at the time, recalls people, um, uh, a number of faculty and others, picketing on Nancy Lavieri's behalf at this time. Uh, so there's a, a very, very long history of, and I can't go into it all, of attempts to discredit uh, Nancy Lavieri throughout this time, and some of which the Hospital for Sick Kids played a part in. So for example, liver biopsies were, in her view, a necessary part of um, monitoring the impact of the drug on the patients in the trial, um, many of whom were um, teenagers or adolescents. And in an attempt to discredit, this was, uh, it was essentially argued that this was somehow irresponsible of her. That resulted in a complaint that the Board of Trustees of the Hospital of Sick Kids made to the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario against her, um, a proceeding uh, which was subsequently found her, uh, those allegations to be completely unfounded. So in other words, what we have here is a, um, a very long and painful process in which the drug company did a great deal to try and discredit Nancy Lavieri, and the university and the hospital uh, did not intervene uh, either on her behalf or on, her, or on behalf of the other primary interests we've discussed. What, what is important in this case, by the way, is not whether Nancy Lavieri's concerns about the drug were founded or not, although she is, remains very persuasive on, on, on the fact that they were fully justified. What is important is that she and the trial participants and scientific integrity more broadly were not protected and supported by the University of Toronto and the Hospital for Sick Kids. So just to recap, the primary interests in this case, as I say, were the protection of the trial participants, public health and public safety more broadly, scientific integrity, academic freedom, and researcher independence. And the secondary interest, of course, was not um, something entirely divorced. The university wanted the money because it thought that it could do lots of terrific research as a result, but one could clearly see the price that was being paid in this case. And I was asked to speak about this case because of my personal involvement, um, and I've mentioned it many times in SAFRA, uh, in SAFRA seminars to which uh, Dr. Korn has been present. But it's just one of a number of cases um, that what we or others in the room could have discussed. And I should add that Nancy Lavieri is in the room, so if some of you have questions, she, I'm sure she'd be happy to, to answer them. Um, but I think what's important to think about is not just looking at it through the lens of um, institutional financial conflicts of interest, but also to talk about it <clears throat> in the framework of uh, institutional corruption. And uh, Larry Lysig has defined institutional corruption as the, the consequence of an influence within an economy of influence that illegitimately weakens the effectiveness of an institution, especially by weakening public trust of the institution. I have my own iteration of the definition. I tend to parse out um, uh, integrity and public trust. So I, the definition I've used is widespread or systemic practices that undermine the integrity of an institution or public trust in an institution. So um, integrity, in my view, requires an examination of the relationship between the mission and the purpose of an institution and its practices. And as a number of speakers before me have pointed out, the mission of institutions evolves over time, and some of these evolutions in recent years have been particularly challenging. But one way of thinking about a sort of lack of integrity is to say an institution might lack integrity if its practices predictably undermine 
the pursuit of the very goals in terms of which it justifies its existence. And um, one can often look at institutions and their commitments to advance health or research um, and ask whether the uh, funding streams are in some way undermining this commitment. So integrity is important. I recognize that when the mission of an institution is in flux, integrity is a complex question, particularly with institutions that also have conflicting missions. But in these cases, trust is also implicated, and trust in two senses. Um, take, picking up on uh, Francis Cam's comment earlier, trust in the sense of trustworthiness, is the institution trustworthy, which is not an empirical question. But then the other component is public trust. And then there are some empirical ways to demonstrate that. And clearly, um, one can see from the text of this report, public trust in the university and the hospital for sick children was fundamentally undermined in, in this case. The, um, just to show you two, two more of the findings uh, of the inquiry by the Canadian Association of University Teachers. It found that Apotex should not have attempted to impede Dr. Olivieri from informing patients, regulators, and the scientific community of the risks of the drugs she identified. This was against the public interest and was inappropriate conduct by the company. The hospital and the university should have effectively supported Dr. Olivieri in the exercise of her rights and obligations, as this was a matter of academic freedom and the protection of public interest, but they did not do so. They also noted the, genuine, the general features of the situation were not unique to Toronto or to the Hospital for Sick Children. It could occur at many institutions across Canada. One might have rephrased that to say North America. Um, and indeed, there are many, many lessons to be learned, but it is essential to put in place measures to ensure that the conduct of clinical research trials, the public interest is protected from inappropriate actions by trial sponsors. Um, What's important is that in their discussion of lessons learned, they noticed that it's a system-wide problem, and again, that public interest was likely to suffer if it wasn't addressed. So I want to um, conclude by noting uh, a couple of factors which I think are important. The first is that what we have here is a, strikes me as a very egregious example of, of what happens with serious institutional financial conflicts of interest, or one can frame it as a corruption of an in, a, a major institution, research institution. But these are the, this is one example that we know about because one researcher, Nancy Olivieri, devoted um, and has devoted more than a decade of her life to this conflict at great personal expense, financial, and in terms of her career. And there are a number of other cases one could cite, but they are, you know, one can count them. The question that is more fundamental, in my view, is what happens when the researcher doesn't stand up, when the researcher isn't prepared to make this kind of investment. Now, there have been some, uh, there have been some institutional reforms. Um, and I can't speak particularly to the University of Toronto, but at various institutions regarding the review of funding contracts. But I think it's important to note um, again, drawing from the institutional corruption framework, that there are other ways in which um, funding can uh, distort research and threaten the public interest. For example, what is the effect, even of an unrestricted gift, where the donor gives it and says, uh, as has happened at my own institution, this is the first, and I anticipate the largest, of a series of gifts. What is the effect on that, on the institutional support for research that might be contrary to the interests of such a donor? Um, so there are real questions about the impact of, of these funding streams on research priorities and on research agendas, and potentially the distortion of research agendas. To give you one, I know I'm talking about Olivieri, but I want to give you one brief example from another area of my own work, the work that I've been doing at SAFRA, just to demonstrate. So in the area of food and nutrition research, we have a number of <coughs> nutrition departments across the country who are being paid by um, interested actors, trade associations, companies, to demonstrate that certain foods um, provide health benefits above and beyond basic nutrition. 
So this results in a number of things. It results in the framing of certain public health questions related to obesity and diet as um, questions of individual behavior. It results, it results in a technological bias favoring certain kinds of solutions to these problems, including satiety supplements that make you feel full. Um, and it might, in my view, result in a different kind of organized skepticism to the kind of skepticism that Jonathan Cole was talking about in the positive sense. So ideally in the academy, the kind of skepticism we have, the organized skepticism, is something that applies across the board. But what if these funding streams are creating a distorted organized skepticism, where the skepticism of those projects that are contrary to the interests, or at least don't have synergies, with large institutional sponsors, and a lack of skepticism for those that fit very nicely with those sponsors. So I'm just going to conclude by saying the Olivieri case really demonstrates the tip of the iceberg, in my view, a case where a researcher isn't protected because of a huge institutional financial conflict of interest. She devotes her life to fighting this at great personal financial cost, and we all know about it. It's one of a number of cases, but they are small. What about all the other cases where nothing happens? And then even if one puts in place the mechanisms to address the kinds of problems that arose here, what about the bigger picture issues that I've just, I've just identified, including research agenda distortion? Okay, that's all, thank you.